Hi, welcome back to Standing Strong for Marriages, a YouTube channel dedicated to helping people walk through marriage separation or divorce using Christian principles. Thanks for coming by. Hey everyone, welcome back. Today I'm going to do a video on something that I ran across called the Erasmus Error. This video you could kind of take it as a follow-up to the one that I just did on David Pawson's talk. David does an hour and a half long talk on divorce and remarriage and he has an interesting perspective. He was actually invited to be on the Evangelical Council in England um, quite a few years ago as England was trying to figure out what they were going to do with their policy politically and how they're going to handle their citizens looking for uh, looking to get divorces and how the church is going to be involved in that. That aside, the Erasmus era, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, one thing I would like to say that why it ties into David's talk is David has a view that he really thinks that uh, no one is able to get uh, remarried uh, post-divorce. And um, the reason for that is that he believes that only people can rightly get divorced in the situation where one spouse in the marriage dies. So this isn't a view I haven't heard before, but I just want to make it clear before I jump into it. Um, the article I'm going to be looking at is by Dr. Leslie McFall, and it's very technical. Uh, I will leave a description for it, but I mean it goes back into you know all these um, Greek translations, different transcripts or manuscripts that they had from different eras, how as archaeology found new transcripts and they're able to do better research. Um, there's different things in Greek, which very little I'm going to have in, in here on that, but it is important. And I'm going to try to figure out who was this Erasmus person, what was the change that was made to the scriptures that David was referring to, how did that change affect the meaning of the verse or the sentence, and then what happened historically, and where does that leave us today as far as trying to sort through this thing. Basically asking the question, you know, am I in a uh, valid divorce? Am I able to get remarried? What does the scriptures say? And since we have this uh, problem apparently, uh, especially for Protestant scriptures, it looks like. Uh, I'm going to try to get into, into that. So let's, let's do it. All right, y'all. So here we go. Let's check this out. So the Erasmus there, like I said, David mentioned it. He said that it was an important part, and it led to a lot of uh, the foundations for why he saw things as far as he did as far as divorce and remarriage. So this all comes from, like I said, part one of Dr. Leslie McFall's work entitled Biblical Teaching on Divorce and Remarriage. It's right here, and you can see... Boom, we're going to be looking at part one, but man, it's not a short work. They seriously got after it on this thing. So, you know, it's like a full on seminal work, like a, you know, <clears throat> years and years, I would say, hours and hours at least. So, all right, so who was this, this Erasmus person? So, this is Darius Erasmus, 1466 to 1536. Um, all these quotes, by the way, are all coming directly from this paper. So it says, uh, the Dutch humanist, he was not a reformed Christian by any means. He was a priest in the Roman Catholic Church. And it said that the Roman Catholic Church taught that, quote, the bond of marriage cannot be dissolved on account of adultery of either party, and that neither, not even the innocent, who has not given cause for the separation can, while the other party lives, contract another marriage and that adultery is committed by the husband who divorces his wife and marries another, and by the wife who divorces her husband and marries another. So one thing I want to look at right here is I want to break this into two halves. So let's just start with this bottom half. This would be like the person who leaves, so the husband who leaves and marries someone else commits adultery. If the wife is the one who leaves and divorces someone else, uh, then she's the one who gets, commits adultery. Now this top half is more about the person who was left, and so um, it's basically the bonds of the marriage cannot be dissolved on account of adultery of either party and that neither, not even the innocent, and I'll get back to this red part, but not even the innocent who has given cause for separation can, while the other party lives, contract another marriage. So this is talking about the person who was left. Even in their situation, the Catholic Roman Catholic Church taught that even that person uh, was not able to remarry, and that was their stance. Now, this part in red, I highlighted, one, because I'm not Catholic, but two, I thought uh, there could be two important things. One, this may not still apply. They may have changed, you know, um, some of the rules since this was put out. I'm not sure. You might want to check that out. Um, 
you know, I don't know how significant that is um, for you, but um, but the other important thing is who has not given cause for the separation can while the other party lives. And so I started thinking about what what do they even mean by that? What is has not given cause for separation? And I think what they're probably going to mean. You can check this out further if this is really you and you're your, um, Catholic, but I think what it really is going to mean is uh, that they didn't sleep with someone else. So uh, that would be the cause for separation. I, I, I'm just going to guess. I'm just going to say, um, yeah, I'm just. just going to say that. But anyway, the point is either party, um, you know, Neither is able to to contract another marriage. It doesn't matter who was who. Okay, so this next part, and I'm going to put this in here with this uh, a screenshot because of some Greek. But it said, basically, Erasmus was extremely angry at this insensitive, dogmatic stance of his church over this teaching. It says he believed that divorce was justified in the case of adultery. So when he came to produce the first published edition of the Greek New Testament, he deliberately chose the small Greek word, and I'm just going to say EI. You can read it here if you're fluent in Greek. You can read this, and forgive me, I'm, that wasn't, that's not what I do. But um, So he chose to deliberately insert this Greek word EI, and inserted it before the MH in Matthew 19.9 to allow for divorce. So that was the change that it had. It changed the meaning and so to allow divorce for adultery, despite the fact that the three gospel manuscripts which he used did not contain this Greek word EI. So basically that's the idea. You don't have to know Greek. I don't know Greek. It, it's not even really important what this word means. Um, maybe someone can help us out. But the point is, is right here, that it changed it to allow divorce for adultery. So that was the point. So what they go on to try to show is that this had uh, effects later on in other major transcripts, or this first one is called the Majority Greek Transcript, or the Byzantine. The second one, the Minority Greek Text, uh, which is the Vaticanus, the Bize, or the Lysistrinus. Uh, so we'll start with this first one. You'll notice here I did this part here in highlight because I'm going to reference that footnote. I think it's really important and clears up what this means because I think it it can have it's it's not clear. It could have a double meaning, but we'll look at this. So Matthew 19:9, uh, according to the majority Greek text. Now I say to you that whoever shall dismiss his wife not over fornication and shall marry another, he commits adultery. And the one who marries one divorced commits adultery. So you notice in this top one, the idea is the adulterer is the one who dismisses his wife, that he's the adulterer. It'll change down here and you'll notice it. The minority Greek text, like I said, Matthew 19.9, same verse. Now I say to you, whoever shall dismiss his wife apart for the matter of fornication... Same here, over fornication, fornication. He makes her to commit the adultery. So now it becomes the person who was left eventually commits adultery, assuming they remarry. And whoever shall marry one dismissed, he commits adultery. So you have these two things. I want to I want to point out, this may be confusing as we go, so I'm just going to clarify it now. The point of this whole chapter is essentially going to say that this change done by Erasmus here, this change with this Greek word here inserted changed the meaning of the translation, this Greek New Testament translation, and that century after century after century that had kind of a waterfall effect and it changed the way that people thought about uh, you know, what were the grounds for divorce, and in a wrong way. That's their point. It did it in a wrong way, meaning that this is an illegitimate change to the text, and it was not caught and for many years later. And so this became like a whole huge move that should, should not have happened. They're going to basically say their end point is going to be there are no reasons for... Uh, divorce, 
except for death. And so this divorce for adultery thing is not right. And that's where they're going. That's where they're really going. So I want to make that clear just because it's going to, I think it can get confused. I'm going to try to make it clear. Okay, so let's look at this, not over fornication. I want to look at this footnote 17, which is here. He says, what does this mean? Not over fornication. What does this little phrase mean? He says, in effect, Jesus was saying for every cause which is not covered by the death penalty, period. That's the first idea. Second idea, the sin of fornication or adultery was deliberately chosen by God to be punishable by death and only by death. Okay, so then the next idea, divorce was never an option and it is not included in Deuteronomy 24, which describes, not prescribes, how the Jews obtained divorces only for non-capital causes. And describes, uh, describes how people went about this, but does not like prescribe. It doesn't tell people this is what they should do. It just was describing what, what was happening in the past. Okay, so hence, Jesus uses the phrase, not over fornication, to encompass all causes not involving the death penalty. And which ones is he talking about, the death penalty ones? This was fornication, this was adultery. And if your spouse did those things, they would have been put to death. And that would have been the end of the situation. You, would have just, you obviously would have been able to um, remarry. It would have been a non-issue. So, okay, so what is... Hence, Jesus uses the phrase, not over fornication, to encompass all causes not involving the death penalty, whereby men divorce their wives. The Jews understood the will of God, that all adulterers were to be killed. So, let's go back here. Remember, not over fornication means all the cases not involving the death penalty. So, let's read this. So, Matthew 19, 9. Now I say to you that whosoever, whoever shall dismiss his wife not over fornication, and shall marry another, he commits adultery. So meaning, it, if this guy divor divorces his wife, and she didn't commit fornication, she didn't do something that would have gotten her killed, either adultery or fornication, then the guy couldn't have, you know, he couldn't have divorced her. And that's, that's what this is saying. Now you have to remember that the author and... David Pawson, people that hold this view, are going to say that this whole thing, this whole verse here in the top and this whole verse in the bottom are not the actual Bible, that they were changed. So this, none of this applies, and this is why I was saying it's confusing. So they belabor all this point to say that what does this mean? It would mean that you know a person could not divorce their wife unless there was fornication or adultery. Okay, but they don't believe that this phrase is in here. See, this is the phrase they're talking about that was added. They don't think that this is a verse that should have rightly been in the scripture at all. So, they just, yeah, so that's, I guess that's the big point. So I'm guessing it would read, how it would read then, without that change in there, it would just say, now I say to you, whoever shall dismiss his wife, he commits adultery or Anne marries another, he commits adultery. There's no, there's no exception in, in, in what they're saying. So that's, and we're going we're gonna to look on to, um, to some other, other changes, what happened in the Vulgate. So let's flip over here. It says, Erasmus also changed the Latin Vulgate, which was the Bible of the Roman Catholic Church from the time of Jerome, which is about AD 420. The Latin Vulgate read, and I say to you that whosoever shall put away his wife unless, so here's the first Greek word, I'm not going to read these, unless, uh, unless for fornication, the Latin, and marry another committeth adultery, and whoever marries one put away, he commits adultery. Now, okay, there's going to, here's the change in Greek, so this is how I guess it, uh, the Latin Vulgate read this, and Erasmus changed it, even more liberal than the change he did in the Greek. So again, we're talking, we have two Bibles now in two different languages. The first one that we looked at was the Greek. This one is uh, in Latin. So now it's been translated from Greek, I believe, into Latin. 
And so in this version, he also made a change. But this change was even more liberal. It was even more significant. He didn't just, it, you know, it already said fornication, according to this. And he changed to this other thing. We'll check it out right here. Which would read, Erasmus altered this in his second edition in 1519 to read, And I say to you that whoever shall repudiate, notice that's a different word, different than this, whosoever shall repudiate his wife, unless it be for disgrace, which is stuptrum, a whole new word, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. Now, why is this important? Well, here's what they say. By changing the word for fornication to stuptrum, Erasmus widens his acceptive clause from the sexual sin of fornication to the general catch-all phrase of anything that gives ground for, quote, dishonor, disgrace, defilement, unchastity, debauchery, lewdness, and violation, dot, dot, dot. It goes on, suddenly, Erasmus offered divorce not just on sexual grounds, i.e. for fornication, but for any cause that gave rise to dishonor or disgrace, which may not necessarily be sexual, such as abuse, neglect, desertion, or anything that a partner feels angry about. So you can see now this is a much bigger change and the implications are much larger. Let's keep going. Here's what happened. <clears throat> they say, and this is directly from there. Uh, now, while it was left to liberals, radicals, and humanists to discover and uncover Erasmus's understandable mistake... And while all shades of non-evangelical textual scholars are now in agreement in not including the Erasmanian edition in any modern critical edition of the Greek of the Greek New Testament since 1847, Lachman, a strange thing has occurred in English translations, namely. Not a single major English translation has departed from Tyndale's translation of Matthew 19, 9, which accurately reflected Erasmus's opinion of what he thought Scripture taught. Every modern English translation retains Erasmus's doctrine while at the same time rejecting his Greek text. What a strange schizophrenic situation. So they really, to sum up, if you didn't catch it, or if you're driving or whatever, you know, basically what they're saying is people are aware, people that write Bibles and produce published Bibles, whatever, who work in the translation side of things, they're well aware of this change. The research has been done. But when they're doing these, you know, translations, and we'll look at a few here in a second, they're not reflecting, uh, they're not going back to, to how it, was before Erasmus changed these things. So, for example, they say the ESV, this is the English Standard Version translation, would have been a financial disaster for the publisher if it had removed Erasmus's acceptive clause and replaced it with the content identity phrase that Jesus used. No modern translation dare translate Matthew 19.9 according to the Greek text of the two critical editions and the two published majority texts by Hodges and Farstad and Robinson and Pierpont. To do so would upset thousands of Christians who have remarried while their spouses were still alive, not to mention these same people that work in translation, not to mention translators who are hardly likely to put their remarriages in the context of adultery. And so the compromise is perpetuated in every modern language translation to date. So, of course, uh, they're arguing every English, uh, obviously not everyone in the whole world, but um, their concluding remarks in part one are, quote, those who counsel divorce to Christians are still living within their old nature and operating out of that old nature while professing to have the new nature of Christ. They have not known a born-again experience, nor known the transforming change that Christ brings. They are still strangers to these spiritual experiences, yet profess to be mature Christian marriage counselors. These counselors are cute enough to know how to avoid being caught out and will indulge in smooth talk. 
seeming to teach Christ's doctrine of full forgiveness for all sins, but really pander to human common sense if the wrongdoer does not want forgiveness. They go on, and they conclude by saying, the issue is not whether Jesus was for or against divorce. The issue is whether divorce is compatible with being a Christian and compatible with the Spirit of Christ living in the body of each believer. If his presence within the believer does not make divorce obsolete as a concept and totally, totally irrelevant, then something is seriously wrong with the claim that Christ is residing in that person. You cannot hold to divorce and hold to forgiveness at the same time. They are opposed one to another in the new nature. So, again, all quotes are taken from part one of Dr. Leslie McFall's work entitled The Biblical Teaching on Divorce and Remarriage. So, in summary, I mean, I hope that was clear, clear enough. If you want to check out the entire article, um, you can, of course. It's um, quite a lengthy process. I spent a bit of time just because of the complexity of the things that they bring into the article from Greek manuscripts and a lot of just things that I wasn't exactly familiar with. It was very enlightening and it helps me understand how there are certain people in the church or among Christians who hold the view that there are um, you know, no grounds for uh, divorce um, and also no grounds for remarriage. That named Erasmus, and that the changes, although small as far as characters and number of words, actually had a huge impact on the meaning of why people thought uh, Matthew's gospel uh, made an, uh, an allowance for divorce, for adultery, or fornication, while Mark and Luke's gospel actually don't mention these things. This change was picked up by a lot of Protestants and really continued to move in that direction. Um, they also noted that the Roman Catholic uh, Church after Erasmus somehow transitioned to a different manuscript or a different translation uh, that didn't have this same change and so it's what's resulted in the Catholic Church continuing to have uh, their view that there's no grounds for divorce uh, except for death. But, um, well, that, there you have it, you guys. So, anyway, um, I, you know, I hope that helps. It just helps bring um, food for thought, um, as well as a better understanding of some of the people that you know we're going to encounter if we're going through a divorce or a marriage situation, marriage separation situation, and you know how we might get a lot of um, you know pushback if we decide to remarry or advice that people are going to give um, or just opinions that they might have but maybe they didn't even really know where they got them from or where they came about it's just something that they were told or taught well so anyway this would hopefully help you kind of like see where people are coming from when they have these opinions and better able to understand just the variety of opinions and perspectives as you sort through what you're going to do in your future so Bless you guys. Hey, I am always sorry, you know, to hear about divorce, but, um, you know, one of the reasons I put this channel together was just to help people, I think, think through uh, God's plans, His wisdom. Um, there are so many perspectives, so to help people just um, go to one, kind of one-stop shop and get just the easy, the low-hanging fruit, just the summaries, the general ideas um, summarized of what people are saying and why they're saying those things. And ultimately, man, I just, I really hope to see more marriages uh, work out. And I think that God also wants to see that. So just bless you guys while you're out there. Continue to do your thing. Recover. Um, you know, do all the right things that you've heard. Take care of yourself. And we'll talk to you next time.